Yeah, I think one of things about My name is Eileen Barzo, I'm the Associate Director of the Political Science Undergraduate Program. And the School of Arts and Sciences has asked me to extend their welcome to you to this Knowledge by the Slice series. We have uh, five Political Science faculty members who are going to be talking with you today. And I won't send, say much in introductions other than to actually thank the School of Arts and Sciences for working with us and helping to coordinate this event. We really appreciate it. And everybody who's here um, doing that, thank you very much. Ed? Uh, good afternoon. My name is Edward Mansfield. I'm chair of the political science department and I'll be moderating today's event, which is entitled Politics of Hard Economic Times. Hard actually seems like an understatement. In the United States, unemployment continues to exceed 9%. Demand for goods and services remains depressed. The stock market continues to gyrate wildly and public anger over the economy, illustrated most recently by the Tea Party and the protesters on Wall Street, is higher than at any point since at least the 1970s and perhaps the Depression. In Europe, Greece is narrowly avoiding default on its sovereign debt, and many market analysts consider it just a matter of time before that happens. Fears are widespread that Italy, Ireland, Portugal, and Spain will soon follow. Banks in Europe are under increasing stress, and the EU, led by Germany and France, is struggling to figure out how to recapitalize the banks, lest a wave of sovereign defaults precipitates a financial meltdown like 2008 in this country, and perhaps the integrity of the euro itself. Recently, some observers have expressed hope that the emerging markets might help to revive the global economy, and China is the country most frequently referred to in this vein. But the Chinese economy shows, shows various signs of overheating, including mounting inflation and a housing bubble, concerns that are exacerbated by institutional deficits in its banking sector. And after a decade of growth that approached China's experience, India's economy has started to slow down, and Russia's isn't in much better shape either. So what to do? Clearly part of the answer involves advancing new policies. Equally clear is that disagreement about what these policy solutions should be have turned bitter and fierce. One of the oldest truisms in the policy world is that policy requires politics. Today, four of my colleagues in the political science department have joined me to discuss the politics associated with navigating the roiling economy. Mark Meredith and Matthew Lewandowski will discuss the United States with a particular focus on the upcoming election. Julia Gray will discuss the Eurozone crisis, and Yu Hua Wang will discuss the situation in China and whether economic conditions in the United States and China will lead to a new era of Chinese leadership of the global economy. So I'm told that each of the participants will speak for about seven minutes, and after that, we'll turn to your comments and questions. And thank you very much for coming. Okay, first up. Uh, sure. Uh, so I'm Matt Lemdusky from the Political Science Department. Uh, I want to talk about three things uh, today. Uh, so the first one I want to talk about is sort of what relationship this might have or the economy might have to Obama's electoral prospects in 2012. Um, so we can ask, you know, will the economy hurt Obama in 2012? And the answer is obviously yes. The problem is we don't know how much. Um, so if you've taken a, a class or you've uh, read 538 or um, you know, been reading even the New York Times more generally, has had a couple of articles about these kind of predictive models that people have that uh, look at the relationship between economic growth under um, the incumbent and then his eventual vote share, right, you know, you'd know that there's a pretty strong relationship uh, between those two factors and Professor Meredith will be talking about that in, in somewhat more detail. Um, but there's kind of a caveat when you're, when we're thinking about how to apply these models to 2012, um, right? And that's really the kind of post-World War II, we don't really have um, many elections where economic fundamentals have been this weak for this long. Uh, 
Um, and it, if you look at the data, the pre, you might think, well, let's just go back and look before World War II. The problem is the economy is just so fundamentally different back then relative to today. Those elections actually don't provide a whole lot of guidance. There was a, a very nice post two weeks ago by Nate Silver on, five, on his blog, 538, um, about this point that if you look at just the sort of economy as a whole, its relationship to um, political outcomes, it, it, there just seems to be kind of a sea change, you know, pre and post World War II. Um, and there could be a number of different reasons why that's the case, right? And we might also be tempted to say, well, we'll just look at 2010, or we'll look at the special election that happened in New York 9 a couple of months ago. The problem is that we also know that midterm elections aren't particularly good guides to what will happen in the next presidential election, right? So that said, there's some, you know, while we can use those kind of models to think about how, we, you know, the economy might impact Obama's uh, performance in 2012, we need to take them with, you know, the proverbial very large grain of salt. That said, if we were to use um, the forecast numbers that we have right now, which is that uh, we ex economists expect the U.S. economy to be growing at about 2.5% by next year. Obama will get about 51% of the vote, plus or minus about 4%, right? So a very close election, right? But that said, there's another couple of reasons beyond even the economy more generally why we need to treat those estimates with some, let's say, healthy skepticism. The first one is that the Supreme Court will likely issue a ruling on the uh, Affordable Care Act, AKA Obamacare, sometime next year, right? Because if you saw, there have now been two different circuit courts that have had contradictory rulings about whether or not the ACA is actually constitutional, right? So that will prompt a Supreme Court challenge, um, presumably with a ruling coming uh, sometime around the end of next summer. Uh, <clears throat> You know, the Republican candidate isn't exactly clear at this point. It's looking increasingly like it'll be Mitt Romney, but we don't know that for sure yet. No one's actually voted. Um, and, you know, as Lynn Vavrick's book from last year reminds us, the campaign really matters, right? And will matter the way in which Romney or whoever the eventual Republican nominee is, how they choose to frame the economy, and how they're able to assign blame for the economy. And again, uh, Professor Merrith will talk about that, um, a, you know, a little bit more later on. We also know the ways in which the um, media frames and talks about the economy will matter. So if the economy is recovering, right, and that becomes the story, then that obviously helps Obama a great deal. Even if economic growth isn't very strong, if the story gets to become, oh, the economy is doing better now than it was before, we're digging out of the depression, or things are getting better, right, then that has a very different implication than, you know, economic growth is still stagnant, we don't seem to be doing much better. Finally, um, the last thing to say is that a forecast is just a forecast. It could be wrong for any number of reasons, right? So without much improvement in the economy, Obama will face an uphill battle, although he you know, certainly could still win. Um, you know, we've, we've uh, read National Journal, Ron Brownstein had a nice column last week where he talked about, you know, if the economy doesn't improve, how would Obama win? Um, the answer is basically um, strengthening gains in minority communities and consolidating college-educated women. Um, <clears throat> right, so that's a long-winded way of saying we think it'll hurt Obama, we're just not quite sure how yet, right? And part of the reason why is just that'll depend kind of on the context of the election and, and how that kind of develops. The next thing I want to talk about, and this is just more kind of a general comment than a, anything in any detail, is I want to touch briefly on this idea of populism and, and voter anger. So there's been a lot of discussion about this. Um, in recent weeks, uh, particularly with, you know, the Occupy Wall Street that's now, I guess, spreading to occupy the lower half of New York and Occupy Philadelphia, Occupy Madison, whatever. Um, <clears throat> those, that kind of voter anger is a real double-edged sword. So, uh, from a political point of view. So, on the one hand, you can see it being potentially beneficial, right? It certainly seems to have helped some Republican candidates in 2010. Uh, you know, by harnessing the kind of Tea Party um, anger at the overreach of the federal government. Um, whether or not it will, that will repeat itself in 2012, uh, either for the Tea Party and Republicans, or if Democrats will be able to <coughs> harness this, <coughs> sorry, it, it's very unclear, and even if you can, it's unclear to me that that's not very much a two-edged sword, because that could easily backfire against you, right? That. It's very easy to mobilize people against something. It's much harder to mobilize them for something. So it's easier to say, reject Obama, than it is to say, mobilize for some sort of positive ideal. Um, it's not 
I mean, it could end up that those, if the, you know, say the Occupy Wall Street can't kind of coalesce around one or a small number of policy demands to make on government, there could just be sort of a, an exercise in frustration that doesn't really lead to any lasting political change. Yes, I know sociologists say many social movements begin as kind of leaderless, amorphous movements, but the key distinction there is begin, um, right? That they have to then evolve into something more and they have to evolve into a systematic movement that has some mechanism for producing change within the halls of power, right? And so whether or not they can even coalesce around something to demand of government, let alone achieve it, remains very much to be seen. Finally, the last thing I want to talk about briefly are some uh, broader effects on kind of public opinion. So I think in some ways the most important and most interesting uh, and perhaps most consequential effect of um, the politics of hard times is the difference between cyclicality and counter-cyclicality in government spending. Um, so there's public opinion work that talks about how when the economy is doing poorly, people's preference is to cut back on government spending, right? Because people want to be people want to be cyclical. That is, right? They think we should spend more money when things are going well. We should spend less money when things aren't going well, right? So you can see this, right? In people's sort of preferences for cutting back spending, right? Over the last few years, more and more people seem to be saying yes, yes, we should cut back spending. This isn't a good thing to be spending all this money when the U.S. economy isn't doing well. We have all this debt. We have to, you know start uh, paying down the debt, right? But economists would actually argue that that's not the right way to think about this, that what we should do is we should be counter-cyclical. That is, when the economy is doing poorly, right, the government should step in to basically give a demand shock to the economy, right? Because ordinary people and ordinary businesses don't seem to want to spend money now. So what should the government do? The government should come in and it should spend now, uh, right, in order to try and stimulate economic growth. And in fact, when the economy is doing well, that's when government should cut back, right, so it doesn't displace private investment that would otherwise, um, that otherwise uh, fill in, right? So Robert Reich, the former Clinton administration official, has been making this argument quite a lot in the past few weeks, particularly in light of the uh, low cost of borrowing for the U.S. economy right now, there's low yields on treasuries, right, that what we should be doing is having the government massively spend money, right, and invest in things like infrastructure, schools, jobs, etc. In fact, Brad DeLong, who's a well-known Berkeley macroeconomist who writes a, a reasonably well-known blog, um, basically says the U.S. government should just be handing out $1,000 checks to people, right, and saying you get, you know, 20 years to spend $1,000, um, you know, basically interest-free, and you, owe, you or your descendant owe it back in 20 years, right? The idea being that we should be pumping money into the economy to try and stimulate it, right? But of course, uh, as President Obama found out yesterday with the failure of his jobs bill in the Senate, there doesn't seem to be much political will or public opinion support um, for that idea, right? So there's this kind of irony that uh, economists seem to be saying, well, we should be spending more money, right? The cuts right now are bad, right? So the Goldman Sachs report that they prepared um, for their clients suggested that the cuts proposed by the Republicans would cut about 2% off of U.S. GDP growth. Ben Bernanke made similar comments last month to Congress, right? That there's this push for economists to spend money. The cuts are actually bad, right? But because of the political climate, um, and, as well as public opinion, there doesn't seem to be... Um, there seems to be more support from that side to cutting back on spending, which according to economists is not what we should be doing. So I think that's actually probably from the US perspective the most consequential, at least domestic, uh, consequence of uh, poor economic times. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Mark Meredith, but, uh, sure. but before we start, I'd note that there are a few extra seats in the front if people who are in the back would prefer. Do you want to switch seats? Yeah, with them? Okay. <laughs> So anyone who's taken uh, a class with me before knows that I love data, and so I couldn't imagine coming to a talk like this and not, not trying to put some, some data up on the, on the board. So if you're going to be subjected uh, to this, we're going to jump forward just a little bit. Um, okay, so as, as Matt referenced in his uh, discussion, there's this robust relationship that exists not just within the U.S., but across almost any uh, democracy between how voters uh, respond to, to, the, to the economy uh, with respect to incumbents. So here's a, here's a scatter plot that just looks at every U.S. election uh, from 1952 to 2004 and, and plots on the x-axis what the growth was in the year leading up to the election in the United States 
uh, and on the y-axis plots what the popular vote margin was for a U.S. Uh, presidential incumbent party. So, in, for example, in 2000, the Democrats would be considered the, the incumbent party, even though Al Gore was running instead of Bill Clinton. And what we see is this uh, upward sloping line suggesting the more uh, election year growth you have, the, the better the, the incumbent party does. And, and why I, I like this slide to make it for my Intro to American Politics class is I, I can put 2008 on this line. I, I, I fit the line using data up through 2004. Election year growth was about 1% leading up to the 2008 presidential election. If you, if you believe this line that says the incumbent party should lose by about 5%, and lo and behold, the, the incumbent party does lose by, by 5%. So this is to say we can, we can forecast elections out, out of our sample uh, pretty well uh, using a model like this. We can also see that not only does how the aggregate economy uh, performance matter in terms of aggregate outcomes, but also uh, how individual people see the economy seems to correlate with with their vote choice. Here, here's a, some data from the 2008 election. Uh, let's, let's put ourselves in the, in the shoes of October 2008. We just had Bear Stearns collapse. We, uh, we have Lehman Brothers collapse. And, and so we have a very, uh, by and large, poor uh, economy. Uh, on an election survey, we often ask a question of the form, uh, has the economy gotten better, worse, or stayed about the same in, in the last year? Uh, and we see how people vote in 2008 is highly related to how they respond to, the, to this question. So for the people who are living in a hole and thought the economy was the same or better in 2008 as the year before, 90% of them reported voting for, for John McCain. Uh, let's, let's, let's contrast this with the people who said the economy is much worse. Uh, only about 30% about of them voted for John McCain. So now we have the same arrogant economy, but people who are thinking about it in different ways and they seem to be voting uh, in line with their beliefs. So there's some political science research that says, no, it's not that they're voting in line with their beliefs. They're just saying how the economy is aligned up with their, their, their political beliefs. So we, we can't necessarily interpret this as in a causal way, but at least it's, it's a correlation that's very interesting. As, as Matt referenced, uh, we, can, we can put some meat behind uh, which economic conditions matter. It's not just the economy, but we can actually think about what specifically it is about the economy that, that drives uh, voter decision making. One of the most famous models of this comes from an economist at Yale named Ray Fair, who since the early 80s has been forecasting each election. He, he switches his model around a little bit, but he tends to point to, to three things that he thinks is, uh, are the most important elements of, of any uh, election with respect to the economy. He highlights the growth rate in real, uh, real per capita GDP in the first three quarters leading up to the election. This is, this is saying what's, what's happening in the very short term matters. So we haven't even experienced this yet. This is what's going to be, be going on in, in the next 10 months or so. This is going to have a big effect. Every percentage point increase in growth we see on average will give about 0.7 more percentage points uh, of a vote share to, to, to Obama. Uh, and the inflation rate also matters a, a great deal. Every in, uh, percentage point increase in the inflation rate uh, has about the equivalent effect on the, on the downside, about a 0.66 percentage point decrease in the in incumbent's vote share. And then what's happened over the whole course of the term? The, the, what happened in the very immediate sense is, is the most important, but GDP growth in, the, in all 15 quarters, for every quarter where we have growth that's extremely high, above 3.2 percent, uh, there'll be about one percentage point increase in Obama's vote share on average. So we can see on, the, on these metrics, we, we don't know what's happened or what will happen in, in the first uh, three quarters of next year. The forecasts are that we will not have particularly high growth. Inflation hasn't been that much of a, of a concern. Uh, and if anything, there's, there's some concerns about deflation. So uh, Obama probably will not be hit too hard with that. And we haven't had that many quarters of extremely high growth over the course of the Obama presidency. I, I should have looked ahead of time. I'm going to say there's probably two or three that have been above 3%. Uh, so he will not he will be benefiting too much from, from long-term growth either. So let's turn to a little bit of polling data that we, we see right now. Uh, here's a question that was asked on the Kinnipiac University uh, poll uh, that went out to about 2,000 telephonies uh, between September 27th and October 3rd, asking, do you think Obama deserves to be, to be reelected? This is a pretty common trend we've seen in recent polling, where 40% or so say they think Obama should be reelected, 50% say he should not, and about 10% say they don't know or, or they uh, refuse to answer the question. What's interesting about asking this question is when we actually put some candidates on the Republican side, it becomes a much closer, uh, much close, closer battle. Romney, uh, in most recent polls, has been slightly ahead of Obama. Uh, Christie was still considered a potential candidate when this poll was taken, and, and him and Obama were roughly equal, and, and Obama is slightly ahead of Perry. This is a general thing we see when the economy is bad. We say we don't want the incumbent, uh, 
until we actually think about what the alternative choice is. And once we put the alternative choice in front of people, uh, we, we, tend to, we tend to, uh, by about 10 percentage points, affect uh, who, who we say we're going to support in the upcoming election. A couple more points I wanted to bring up that are maybe less, uh, less obvious. One is, is thinking about governors. Governors are, are important in, in campaigns for two, two potential reasons. One is having a governor in a state may help you uh, reach resources in that state. So if you're campaigning in Pennsylvania, the, the fact that Corbett's a Republican might help you tap voters or, or see things that you might not have otherwise seen. However, I think in the up, upcoming election, it's going to work in a slightly different way. What, what we saw in 2010 was a number of states, including <coughs> Pennsylvania, but also Wisconsin, Michigan, Florida, Ohio, were under almost unified democratic rule at the state level. And so when we're thinking about who is going to be assigned blame for the economy, it's pretty clear that since Congress is, is in the hands of the Democrats, the presidency is in the hands of the Democrats, your, your state house is in the hands of the Democrats, when you're thinking about who you're going to blame, you're probably going to blame the Democrats. We've seen, a, we've seen a large change that happened in the aftermath of the 2010 elections. A lot of these states that were previously under unified Democratic rule switched to being under unified Republican rule. This happened in Pennsylvania, this happens in Wisconsin, this happens uh, in Florida where you don't go from, a, uh, you go from an independent to, to a Republican. Why this is important is voters are going to have to start to decide who's at fault for the economy. And, and, and while in 2010 I think it was pretty clear, this is going to be a much more nuanced answer uh, moving forward in, in, in 2012. On a CNN poll conducted between September 23rd and September 25th, um, while most people saying they're not approving of Obama, they're more, the, the, the modal answer in terms of who's to blame for the economy is, is Bush and the Republicans. And this is what the campaign is going to be all about uh, with respect to the economy, is who's going to get blamed for, for the state of the economy currently? Is, is it going to be thinking back to, to, to October 2008 and who was in control then? Or is it going to be thinking back to who's the president? Or who, is it going to be who's in charge of your state house? And, and how voters decide to answer that question uh, will, will likely have a big influence on who ends up winning, winning the election. One, one last piece of data on this. Uh, Fox News uh, runs, runs a poll at the end of August, so a little bit dated at this point, but, but asks about three specific groups and how much they're to blame for the specific economic situation we're facing right now. Uh, the first group is, is Bush, the second is Obama, and the third are, are corporations. And, and we see among these three, they all are, are getting a lot of blame with, uh, in the public's eyes. But, but corporations are, are, are number one uh, on this list, and I think this has been manifested uh, potentially with these Occupy uh, Wall Street protests that have spread out, uh, outside of New York now. Uh, it's not clear who, who benefits from, from these sorts of, this sorts of, this sort, uh, sort of anger within, within the electorate. Is it going to be Obama as, as the incumbent, or will it be Mitt Romney, who might be seen as slightly closer to the corporation's interests in, in the eyes of the voters? Again, this will be, this is what will be what the campaign is all about. Uh, final point, this is all about the economy, and obviously, given the state of the economy, it will be shocking if the economy doesn't have an important influence on the election. Last night's Republican presidential debate, it was entirely about the economy, but let's keep in mind that other events can happen too. Here's a, a time series of Obama approval between uh, uh, the start of April this year and the, and the end of May. Uh, and one thing we see is this, this large jump up that happens uh, right around uh, May 2nd. Well, what happens on May 2nd? Osama bin Laden is killed. And so while the economy uh, is first and foremost on everyone's minds currently, it's not to say that if, for, for example, the terror plot that was discussed in the media yesterday had, had come to fruition, uh, that, that can become the, the most important event in the campaign. And it's really too early to say this will be a campaign about the economy since we still don't know what the next uh, year has in store. Okay, so let's turn now from domestic affairs to international ones, and Julia Gray is going to talk to us about Europe. Okay. Thanks, Ed, and thanks, Eileen, for organizing this, and thank all of you all for coming. Um, okay, so I'm Julia Gray, as Ed said. Uh, what is going on in Europe? Um, obviously, there are two dimensions to what's going on, in fact, and one of them is economic, but a pretty big chunk of it is political. Um, so I'll go through the economic logic first, and that too can be broken up into two parts. Um, so a lot of the economic difficulties facing the peripheral countries in Europe now um, can basically be described as either, you know, as, as liquidity crises and or solvency crises, right? So the difference between liquidity and solvency is important if you think about what the policy response is going to be. So what are those two things? Um, well, liquidity is basically just the need for short-term cash 
Whereas sol you know, a, a solvency problem is where you have structural problems that are going to prohibit your ability to finance yourself in the future. So you can all sort of apply this to your own daily lives. You know, if at some fine day you graduate from this wonderful institution, um, you know, you have a lot of expenses facing you. You um, celebrate by going to Cabo or Branson, Missouri, or wherever wherever your fortunes take you, um, and you know you're trying to raise money. You know you're trying to sort of bum money off of your friends. Um, it's going to be a lot easier to convince your friends that you're having a liquidity problem, meaning that you have had a history of gainful employment. You know you've got this shiny degree. You can get a job. You can pay them back back pretty soon. Um, rather than a solvency problem, which basically means that you're going to be sleeping on their couch for the indefinite future because you can't actually raise your own money. Um, so basically, all of the you know all of the countries on the periphery are trying to convince the world and Brussels um, that what they're facing is just liquidity problems, right? That they have the ability to actually um, finance themselves in the immediate future, in the medium term future. They just need cash right now. Um, well, part of the difficulty comes then from what happens when you decide to form a monetary union. <clears throat> so when Greece decided to throw away the drachma, its local currency, for a very long time and adopt the euro along with um, a lot of the other countries in the European Union, um, they were basically facing a situation where their liquidity was, their ability to raise liquidity in the short term was going to be ch challenged. Um, part of this is a function of just what happens when you unify currencies. Once you agree to adopt another, uh, a common currency, you basically give up two tools that are pretty important toward um, you know, responding in the short term to economic shocks. And one is the ability to uh, mess around with your interest rates, and the other is the ability to mess around with your currency, right? So if you recall from 2007, um, you know, one of the Fed's sort of very first things that it did was to you know, make it clear that it was going to let interest rates go very, very low. Um, and the other thing it did was, you know, make it clear that they didn't really care what happened to the dollar, and they were happy to let it, the value of the dollar go low as well. That meant that exporters were going to be advantaged, um, and you know, that was going to be some way of getting getting econ getting currency into the economy. Um, Greece can't do that because it, by giving up its own currency, it has basically said, you know, we're going to let. Um, the central bankers of Europe decide what interest rates are going to be and whatever they are for the entire continent or for the entire Eurozone rather it's what we're going to take on as well um, and because we don't have our own currency we can't devalue it um, so their ability to respond has been constrained now that could just be a liquidity problem but there's also this fundamental solvency problem that is a big issue whenever you have a monetary union right um, and the idea with that is that in order to sustain a common currency all of the member countries have to have um, you know, fiscal policies that look more or less like one another's, right? They have to have um, similar structure to their government budgets. There can't be any huge discrepancy between the way that they fundamentally run their economies to the extent that they do. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the response to the crisis really depends on what kind of problem you think that Greece has. Um, a lot of people now are saying that Greece, and indeed a lot of the other countries on the European periphery, is actually stuck with a solvency problem. That even if you throw, um, you know, whatever chunk of change to bail them out in the short term, that um, their government spending patterns are such, their tax collection patterns are such, um, you know, their obligations to their to, to pensioners and to people, you know, to government workers, all sorts of things are not going to be sustainable in the long run, and political opposition to overturning those policies is going to be too huge, right? Um, so, and you know, I should note too that like part of the EU's response to these crises is itself constrained by language that the EU locked itself into um, at the very time of its formation. Um, so it's, it sort of gets overlooked in the press a lot that technically in the EU, um, it is, it, is, it is written down that they are not allowed to bail countries out, right? That's a specific part of the EU treaties that everybody signed on to. Um, but in fact, since 2007, they have you know, bailed out a lot of countries, both in the Eurozone, both within the EU and outside of the Eurozone, and even on the periphery. Those countries include Hungary, um, which is an EU member but doesn't have the Euro, um, Serbia, not in the EU, no Euro. Um, 
and Ireland EU euro. Um, they've done this, this through sort of tricky accounting. Um, in some cases, in all, in all cases, the IMF has also been involved. Um, in most cases, they've said that it's actually not really bailout funding, but just balance of payment, payments funding, so it's okay. Um, but you know, part of the reason why you keep seeing these, this news about EU leaders like talking and then falling apart and you know, discussions going nowhere is because there's really no structural mechanism within the EU to deal with this. Um, everybody just kind of assumed that that they, you know, they put the common currency in, they put a few rules in, and they fixed it in the mix. Um, convergence was going to happen at some point. Um, and the EU is also really pretty strict in terms of what it allows, even programmatically. So um, you know, a lot of these solutions have been ad hoc. You know, the budgets are set years in advance. They don't really have the personnel to, to, to staff or decide these things. Um, a lot of the people who have been charged of these bail various bailout packages are just doing so like effectively on a volunteer basis. Um, you know, Brussels is really not very coordinated in terms of what they're, what's going on. Um, so what is going on at the exact moment is that the Eurozone members have basically agreed to set up um, something called the European Financial Stability Facility. Again, not a bailout, it's just a financial st stability facility. Um, and it has determined that what it needs to raise in order to get all of the troubled countries through these hard times is close to the tune of $600 billion. Um, now, one of the things that they stipulated was that in order for this fund to be set up, all of the members of the Eurozone had to approve it, right? Um, and what just happened last evening is that Slovakia, which is, I believe, the newest entrance to the Eurozone, um, not a country that a lot of people think about one way or another, I guess, um, has effectively vetoed the bailout facility. Um, why did they do this? Well, again, it's a combination of economic and political reasons. So, you know, $600 billion, a lot of money. Slovakia doesn't have uh, the $11 billion that it would need to contribute to this. Um, most other countries also don't have this, this money, um, so where are they going to get it? Well, for the majority of them, what they're going to have to do, the Eurozone members, is themselves borrow on financial markets to pay into the stability fund um, to bail out Greece and other countries. Um, you know, so there's partially an economic dimension to this. Slovakia borrows on capital markets at a rate of about, you know, an interest rate of about 4.5%. Um, but one of the sort of mandates of the stability fund is that in order to make it feasible that Greece is going to be able to service these loans, the interest rate is going to be capped at 4%. Um, so this is a losing prospect for Slovakia just in very bare terms, right? They have to borrow at 4.5% and lend to Greece at 4 They're steamed about that. Nonetheless, um, within the Slovak parliament, um, most, you know, most, of the, most, most of the parties in, three out of the four parties in the coalition government that they have there um, were actually in favor of voting, in, you know, voting for the, the stability fund, um, primarily for political reasons. Um, the guy and the party that kind of put a halt to all this were the, was this guy, uh, Richard Sulik, who in fact was um, Slovakia's architect of the flat tax back several years ago. Um, and he's also opposing this on, I would say, economic as well as political grounds, right? So there's the, there's the issue that Slovakia can't afford it. But then in a broader political sense, in order to get into the EU in the first place, um, Slovakia really hustled and, and uh, Sulik was part of this hustle to implement all of these very painful reforms into its own economy, um, you know, austerity measures that caused a lot of short-term hardship for its citizens. Um, and they are frankly a little bit steamed that Greece isn't being asked to implement the same measures. Um, their pension um, obligations are much fewer because they brought them down. Um, their vacation, you know, the vacations that they give to people, just basically just on every level, um, Slovakia itself was asked, they feel, uh, to do more to even enter the EU in the first place, and now that they're in, they basically are having to pay for um, more profligate members. Uh, so they're not very happy about that. Uh, what's going to happen in the medium term? Um, there are all sorts of doomsday scenarios that are coming out about what happens if these, if, if the bailout facility doesn't fall through. Um, the most extreme of them center on the prospects of, you know, war fighting between these countries you know we worked so hard to get this european pact set up and now that now that the now the, that the economic foundations are crumbling we're just going to go back to the crusades that's going to be awful um i don't actually think that that's going to happen um you know more pragmatically what's going to happen to the eurozone zone in the short term um there seems to be a lot of consensus that 
Given in its current rules and with its current membership structure, the euro does not work. Um, so either you change the rules or you change the membership structure. Um, so what does that mean in practice? Well, UBS, um, a, bank, a Swiss bank, in fact, just put out a paper a couple of days ago, um, a very alarmist paper. It was totally on the side of like war and crusades and that type of thing. Um, but it tried to put price points on the costs to countries of staying in or, or leaving the Eurozone. Um, what they said was that if a, if a stronger country, such as Germany, were to leave the Eurozone, um, in terms of the, the cost that it would incur to the economy, it would basically be something to the tune of around $10,000 per, per person per year um, for the first couple of years, and then $4,000 per person per year in Germany um, thereafter. That's not trivial. That's about equivalent, uh, equivalent to about a quarter of GDP. Um, so, you know, that's not costless. Um, for a weaker Euro country to exit the Euro zone, such as Greece or Portugal, um, they estimate that the cost would be around $14,000 per, $14, per person in the first couple of years and about $5,000 per person in subsequent years. Um, they set that off against the, con against the cost of bailing, bailing out Greece, Ireland, and Portugal entirely right now today, and they estimate those costs to be about $1,500 per person um, in a single hit with no sort of, you know, no payment off, off in the future. Um, that makes it seem as though, you know, we should just bail them out. But the problem that the Eurozone is facing now is that um, I think at this point most people are convinced that these are actually not, this is not a one-time problem, right? This is not something that one chunk of cash is just going to fix, um, because this isn't a liquidity problem. Um, it is, in fact, a solvency problem. Um, so, you know, the answer to that then is that these countries either have to find some way of um, imposing austerity on their on their on their domestic publics, probably losing the office as a result of that, um, and then just kind of seeing what happens, or the rules of the current eurozone need to be um, dramatically changed in ways that I can't even fathom. In fact, um, that's all I'll say about that. Thank you. And our final speaker will be uh, Yu Hua Wang, who will be talking to us about uh, East Asia and China. So, will China overtake the U.S.? No. Answer is yes. Uh, <laughs> 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 China has been over. China has been growing at a nine percent uh, speed uh, over the last three decades, and uh, I think China is going to keep this uh, growth rate in the next uh, two decades or three decades. Um, this is the, uh, the history of the GDP as an aggregate number. Uh, of the U.S. and China in the last three decades. You can see that China is catching up very rapidly and uh, now the gap is very, very, very small. China is at, uh, has a nine trillion uh, GDP and the U.S. has 14 trillion GDP. Uh, and as The Economist predicts, uh, if China keep growing like this, even slower at a seven point growth rate and the U.S. is grow, uh, growing at a two point um, 25 uh, 2.5 growth rate, and in eight years, in uh, 2019, uh, China will surpass the U.S., becoming the world's largest economy uh, with reasonable exchange rate and inflation. So, are you worried? Um, no, you should not be worried. Uh, I will give you two reasons why you should not be worried. First of all, um, per capita GDP is still, there's a still a large gap between China and the U.S. Uh, China is still a very, very poor country. Uh, the, the fact that China can surpass the U.S. is simply because China has a larger population. Uh, China's population is 1.3 billion, is approaching 1.4 billion. So China um, can, do, uh, can have a much higher aggregate GDP by having a very, very low GDP per capita. So in terms of GDP per capita, China's GDP per capita is lower than one-tenth of U.S. GDP per capita. So it's still falling behind very, very much. So you shouldn't be worried about a rich China. China is not going to be rich in the next uh, three or five decades. So you should not be worried in your lifetime. This is not going to happen in your lifetime. A second thing is that 
there's something called a middle income trap. Um, and China is going to fall in this trap as I predicted. Um, so the theory is that there are two sources of growth, right? One source of growth is investment. You invest $1 this year, you get $10 next year. You invest $2 this year, you get $20 next year. And the, the increase in output is simply a result of a higher investment, right? So you invest more, you get higher output. Um, the second source of, of growth is productivity. Right? So you, you, you invest $1 this year, you get $10 next year, and then you buy, buy a new machine, you buy a, a, a new technology, you hire uh, smarter people, you have higher productivity, so you invest $1, you get $20 next year. So this is a result of higher productivity. The problem of China's growth is that China's growth has been primarily reliant on high investments. Uh, almost one third of the GDP growth comes from government investment. So they rely on investment, not on productivity. So at the early stage of development, you can borrow technology. Right? So you can, you, can, you can borrow whatever the US system or the European system come up with. You can borrow those technology. You can make policies to attract foreign investors. And then you can steal their policy. You can, you can steal their technology. You can borrow their technology. You can develop. But once you enter this middle income rank, you cannot do that anymore because you already exhausted all the technologies that you can borrow. You need to have your own. You need to have your own innovation. You need to have your own system to encourage private entrepreneurs and scientists technologies uh, to make innovations. But China does not have that. Um, I'll show you some pictures. China has a lot of parroted uh, products. This is um, some examples of parroted products. Adidas, AMB, this is McDonald's with three, uh, um, and then Pizza Hut, uh, <laughs> and there are more. Um, Canon, uh, this is supposed to be Puma, but Pig, um, Song, and then KFG. Um, so this is now the system that is designed to deal with this kind of problems. Uh, this is a system that is designed by the Chinese Communist Party to promote GDP growth. What they care about, they only care about one thing, GDP growth. They don't care about protection of intellectual property rights. They want to borrow as much as possible because when they borrow as much as possible, they can boost their economy. So they can, they can borrow the, the technology. They don't care about pr protection of intellectual property rights. Um, so China doesn't have its own Steve Jobs. That's unfortunate for China. And if Steve Jobs was in China, he would have, done, uh, would have di died earlier. Uh, he, would be, he would die of anger uh, because of this loosely, um, uh, loose enforcement of protection of intellectual property rights. Um, <laughs> so what will happen in the in 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 next decades or two decades when China's uh, GDP in aggregate surpasses the U.S.? Uh, it will be happen uh, that in the world there will be two superpowers, right? A, a rich superpower that is the U.S. who is still dominant in, in military, in the economy, in the political world, but there's also another superpower, a second superpower, but a poor superpower. Right? A poor superpower, although its aggregate GDP is very, very high, but its per capita GDP is very, very low. And also, China will have all sorts of problems internally, like inequality. This is a, a regional inequality map. You can see basically all the rich provinces are concentrated in coastal China. They are comparable to New York, to Philadelphia, to California. But there are also a lot of provinces in inland China, in western part of China, that are like African countries. They, they, their income is very, very low. And also there's a big income gap between the rich and poor, and there's also regional uh, uh, income gap. So this is going to be a huge threat to the stability of the regime. Uh, now, the, um, the Communist Party is doing pretty well in keeping social stability and also boosting uh, economic growth, but one day if they keep, if the gap it's like this, in, in the next decades, there will be, potentially will be protest or social unrest. And that is a variable that we need to take into account to predict China's growth. Um, so, will we see convergence? Um, not really, right? Uh, a lot of people predict that there will be convergence between China and the US, um, between Mao and Obama, um, <laughs> but not really. So uh, China will, will become a, so that the share of China's GDP will be huge in the world economy, but China will be only a, a poor superpower. It will not be a very, very rich and strong superpower. And also, because of the political system, China is not going to become a very responsible superpower. So there, there won't be a convergence, at least in your lifetime. So you shouldn't be worried about this. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you uh, to all of the panelists. So um, we have about 45 minutes left, and um, now what I'd like to do is, is turn it over to you. Um, I would uh, encourage you to A, speak up, um, and B, to try to keep your questions as brief as possible so we have as much time as possible uh, to answer them and also to uh, cover as much terrain as uh, possible in the audience. So if you could just keep your, your hands up, I would be happy to call on people. Yes. Question for, you. for Julia or for me? This for Julia or for me? Oh. For both of oh. them. Could you maybe repeat? I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't quite hear the whole thing. Uh, China bought the toxic bonds from oh. the pigs countries. What are the implications oh, yeah. for economic and strategic relations? Oh, yeah, that's awesome. So uh, two points. Uh, one is that China is really worried about a, a decrease in, in euros because that will hurt China's exports to Europe. Right? So th that's why they, bought, they buy a lot of bonds from Europe to boost the, the value of euro. And second of all, I think I just read the news uh, last month. I think the, uh, the Chinese government clearly said that they, they will no longer buy bonds from Europe because yeah. they're worried about the security of the value of the bonds. And, uh, and uh, so they, they've bought a lot from Spain, from other countries uh, before, but I think in the future they will decrease this, this purchase uh, of U.S. bonds. Um. Yeah, I, if, I don't know if that was also to me, but um, yeah, I, th I think that that sort of goes back to what the nature of the problem is, though, right? I mean, you can always have these situations where in the event of a short-term crisis, some third party can come in and like scoop up a lot of the debt. Um, Chavez actually did that when Argentina, not when Argentina defaulted, but when it was proposing a haircut um, subsequently in 2004. Um, they can't really do that now. But, you know, China can do that, but the structural problems, I think, as well as the political problems uh, remain. Brendan? I'm surprised that political scientists didn't address The U.S. has got a beautifully designed system for gridlock. It allegedly has a leader who, according to the last summers, not the most credible sources, leaves, leaves the economic decision makers home alone. The European Union is subjected to treaties which require the smallest member states consent. So they're gridlocked by rules which prevent them from being irresponsible. Um, China has a wonderfully irresponsible that can manage its way out of the crisis. Are we locked in liberal systems which are too well governed and which prevent executive initiative, which might not get us out of the crisis? I think that's a very important factor. Uh, in, at, well, in China, the case is that there will be a change of leadership next year in 2012, and uh, it's very unpredictable what the leadership, what the new leadership will do, what their orientation, what's their attitudes towards economic policy, foreign policy. So it is, it is very important, uh, but it's so, uh, it's so opaque. It's so, it, it's black box in, in Chinese politics, and it's hard to predict what would happen next year. Uh, but but next year we will see, we will see what happens. <coughs> And I would say in the U.S. case, I don't think the problem is as much gridlock as it is the difference that Matt pointed out between what voters want and what politicians often think is the best policy. So I think the electoral connection may be the, the greater source of, of why we do not see as, many, as much policy change in the U.S. For example, on, on, the, on the Obama jobs bill yesterday, two of the Democrats joined along with the Republicans in, in voting uh, against the bill going, going to a vote. I think that is indicative of the fact that uh, these Democrats who are representing conservative areas in, in West Virginia and, Nebra and Nebraska are, are feeling this electoral connection very closely, uh, are doing what they can to be, to be reelected, and you f face this tension during economic crises between doing what uh, perhaps economists say you should be doing, like Larry Summers, and, and doing what your constituents uh, are, are asking of you. And so uh, I think that 
the institutional differences are also very, very important. The fact we didn't even get a vote on the jobs bill suggests that the institutions uh, are important. But I think you shouldn't discount uh, also the, the degree to which uh, what people uh, say they want in, in hard times often isn't what uh, people like Larry Summers think we, we should be doing. Eileen? I'm wondering if you could talk about the relationship between the Eurozone crisis and the U.S. economic crisis, uh, the, the way in which they affect each other. I mean, I think the Eurozone crisis is one of the best things to happen to the dollar, you know, since 2007, <laughs> like the only, you know, the only thing that's keeping it from completely tanking. I mean, um, there have been a lot of attempts to sort of draw the line, you know, draw lines between, um, you know, I mean, I guess not the current econo U.S. economic crisis, but sort of earlier days when states were running, uh, it still happens, you know, states run different fiscal policies while still having the same dollar. I mean, the problem in the Eurozone, though, is that the level of political integration is very new, um, and, uh, but that's, that's sort of, that goes more deeply into Europe rather than the relation. Yes, sir. I want to ask a question that really, you know, it's really directed at all the first three speakers, and it follows up a point that came up before, which is, one thing that's become very clear since the beginning of 2009 is that, at least in the United States, the idea of counter-cyclical fiscal policy is very counterintuitive for most people. One of the things that supposedly we learned since the Great Depression and John Maynard Keynes is that when you're in the middle of an economic crash, the government should run a deficit in order to counterbalance loss of demand and rest of the economy. You're right that most people clearly believe that it makes intuitive sense that if, uh, uh, if households have to tighten their belt, the government should tighten its belt too. I mean, I think the case is right that this creates, um, uh, this, this simply reinforces the downturn. Now, not all economists agree with this. There are small sects, especially Austrians, who don't. But um, at least one major political party now is um, the Republicans is totally committed to some combination of Keynesian dogma and uh, uh, economic illiteracy. And so probably it's impossible, as, or at least it's most likely to be impossible to have a serious counterfeit in the policy. Now the question I have is, this is not just an American problem. We've been all over Europe, and not just in these peripheral countries that are being hammered, there are these austerity policies. And they're not just being promoted by the unwashed masses, but by the European Central Bank and by governments in Britain and places like that. What accounts for this broad ideological shift that amounts to giving up the basic case of the insight? And as long as this ideology is so dominant, are we completely trapped in a situation where it's impossible to do anything constructive to come out of the next crash? So, I think one thing that you have to keep in mind when you're thinking on the Keynesian model is the Keynesian model generally isn't embedded in a political system, and there's been plenty of work in political economy that, that, that embeds Keynesian economics into a political system. And, and an example from the Republican debate last night that I think highlights where the tension that comes up was over Herman Cain's tax plan, the, the 999 plan. And Michelle Bachman makes the point during the debate, which is you're not going to be you're not going to be president forever, and what you're doing is you're giving the government a, a new instrument to tax with, a sales tax. And so you you have a general uh, a general political economy view that once you build uh, institutions and taxing institutions in, into into the policy world, that these these institutions will take on a, a life of their a life of their own. You see this with, for example, healthcare and initially labor-based healthcare coming out of a a, a tax policy post-World War II, and this ends up becoming the entire healthcare state that we, that we know it within the United States. So I think part of the reason why you see uh, a, a counter-cyclical view uh, on the part of, of voters is they're worried about policy lock-in. They're worried that once we, we build up the welfare state, it, it, it's hard to, to get rid of it. And uh, I think for a good reason, because you see time and time again that once the welfare state is, is built up, it, it becomes, becomes tricky. So I think you have this political economy force that's working against the Keynesian force, and in many cases, and if voters aren't explicitly saying this, I would be uh, shocked if this wasn't implicitly part of the, the calculus that they're making when they're deciding what sort of policy reactions uh, they want to, to, to fiscal, fiscal problems like this. Now, that's not to say that that isn't an entirely satisfactory answer, since this would say why we don't want taxation 
or welfare state uh, in, increases at any, at any point in time. But I, I think I think if you're going to if you're going to build on the Keynesian logic, you also have to think about how does Keynes how does Keynes interact with with the political world that that, that we live in. Anyone else? Avery. So I guess this is mostly targeted at uh, Professor Levin Dustin. Thanks. Uh, Frame this in terms of cyclical versus countercyclical policies, and um, I think there's a third view. Of this uh, Noriel Rubini and a couple of other economists put on this report, which claims, uh, in part, or suggests uh, that it's not we re we mistaken the problem. It's not whether it's, it's not the 1930s, it's not the 1960s. That what you're dealing with are secular trends in the economy that suggest that um, we shouldn't view this as part of the cycle. Yes, there is an economic cycle, but the problem is much deeper than that. That given the change in the, the nature of the international economy, the change uh, in terms of the nature of the American economy, that thinking of this in terms of the business cycle alone is just not work. So how would you fold that into the debate? Are you essentially saying that our policymakers are not going to put it in those terms, and voters aren't going to respond in those terms? Well, I mean, I, I don't think voters certainly won't respond in those terms until I think elites sort of put it in those terms. I think elites are afraid to put it in those terms because that opens it up to a much kind of scarier realm of possibility. Um, of, although their hand might be forced, right, if they can't decide how to bail out these European banks and then that weakens already not particularly sound American banks like Chase, JP Morgan, Bank of America, they might have to put it in those terms. But I think they'll resist doing that until they kind of until their hand is forced. At least that would be my sense of it. Yes, sir. That's a good question. I mean, I think it goes back to Brendan's uh, good point of, from before, which is that you know the way that the European political institutions have been set up are is you know require that everybody sort of take an e have a, have an equal vote, right? I mean, and now that gives us the us us the situation where um, you know one minority party and one coalition government in one country has like sunk the entire you know stability fund. Um, in terms of the, so there are huge implications, I think, if there is a backlash, um, electoral backlash in these countries um, for cooperation, right? Because the EU has sort of set it up such that everybody's going to get along and everybody's going to get going to agree, which is easy if you are small, if your membership is small and, and homogenous, but it gets a bit trickier if it's bigger and diverse. Um, you know, I think one of the interesting things that's going on, though, is that you're really seeing this sort of disconnect between, uh, like a more acute disconnect, I guess, between the commission and um, sort of member state preferences. Um, the e you know, the EU, in, in the middle of all this, the director general for enlargement has opened up negotiations um, for accession with Iceland, which was actually, you know, one of the first, if not the first, OECD country to kind of go belly up and start this whole thing. Um, you know, if you sort of read about why that's done, it's, you know, you get a very kind of technocratic answer, which is like, well, the commission was just kind of like, we just showed up for work and that was what was on our desk and that's what we are doing. But um, I guess sort of along what I was saying in terms of like some kind of structural reform that I can't e even fathom what that would actually be, you would think that, that given the divergence, there is either going to have to be some kind of change, either in the membership content or in the rules. Um, and I'm not quite sure what that would look like. Um, so I can't give you a probability, <laughs> but, I, but I think it's high. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. Uh, globalization has, seems to have two dimensions. One is globalization of democracy, and 
market system. And both of these ideas depend on the notion of a free society. And that's where it seems to me <coughs> there exists a conundrum, which is on a society cannot exist without caring for the other. But if you're free, why should you care for the other? So how do you have a free society? So how you should have a, why you should have, or how you, how you can have a free society? The point is that society requires caring for the other. Right. But if you are free, you are free not to care for the other. So it is, if both these issues uh, of uh, democratization and the free market system come into question here. So uh, it's the issue of uh, voluntary cooperation. Why care for the other if you are free not to? Right, so that's why the, yeah, that's a good point. That's, that's where the uh, Chinese Communist Party's legitimacy comes from. The, uh, they argue that, you know, in a free society, people don't care about each other. So I'll, I'll take care of you. Uh, in, so we have, we still, we need to remain authoritarian. Uh, and then the Communist Party is the single party. We take care of, every, of everything. Healthcare, your income, uh, everything, housing. Um, so that's what the Communist Party claims. What do you mean by take it into a, take it into account? In, in other words, that if we are to choose uh, uh, a system of values which is uh, uh, suggests uh, uh, shared epistemic principles, there has to be a common point of view, which is an argument made in recently in Reasons for Reason, which is an article in New York Times in the Stone Forum. That how do you get the shared point of view? Are you asking about this from a policy standpoint, or? I'm, I'm asking about it from a, a, a philosophical standpoint. That we have to deal with ethical relevance in a globalizing world, and we are not. And that's where uh, the question is. It's a philosophical. Well, it depends on what you mean by we. I mean, politicians seem to deal with ethical relativism on a more or less hourly basis, right? It, <laughs> they, they don't have some single standard for what's ethical. It's just sort of, you know, whatever's convenient at the moment. But then we have uh, polarization at present. So how do we deal with that polarization of views? No, I think we've always had polarization. When, when haven't we? I'm not sure that this is very new. I mean, I agree that it's important, but I'm not sure that this is a, you know, you could, you could have made the same case uh, in the 1930s or the 1970s. I mean, how did we get through it then? Well, there were, for instance, during the Depression, uh, the Roosevelt administration had instituted certain uh, uh, institutional changes to deal with, uh, for instance, the FDIC, FSLIC, FDGC, all these institutions provided securities and exchange commission functions which were not uh, addressed before. So the question is how do we, is, is, it, an, is it a time when we need a, a renewed look at long term problems from an institutional design perspective? Well we probably do. I mean the, the, what's sort of built into your question is that if things are catastrophic enough yes. then there's an institutional response. So I guess if you know we wait for uh, economic Armageddon we uh, <laughs> you know, will at some point create some sort of more robust economic reforms. Clearly, over the past, you know, Frank Dodd and these sorts of, so there have been things that have been proposed. Um, but, you know, if what you're talking about are kind of massive institutional overhauls, in Europe you may get this simply because there may be no choice. I mean, you know, either the Euro weakens because of the deviations from the treaty are such that um, it can't remain as it was, or there's some sort of uh, agreement that you need to reinvigorate the initial 
purpose of the euro. But, but that's because everyone has sort of bound themselves to this single currency, so you've got to choose one way or the other. I mean, the United States strikes me as a country that has almost an infinite capacity to bob and weave its way uh, through the sorts of issues that you're raising. The issue that, as, you know, as polarized as this country seems to be at the moment, that we're going to have some agreement on what the route out of this should be um, at the moment, I, I would be surprised. And this relates back to Brendan's question from before, how do, how do institutions and super majoritarian requirements that we have in, in Europe and in the U.S. interact with, with questions like yours. And we, and we see on the Senate floor last week, Harry Reid invoked a new, a new rule saying we don't have to bring this to a cloture vote. We don't need 60 votes. We only need 50. Uh, we see a lot of policy in the U.S. Uh, going through the Federal Reserve where we don't have the same either electoral connection or, uh, or the same super majoritarian requirements, although you sort of, you, you, in some ways you do. But I think the answer in, in, the, in the U.S. case, at least, which I know better, is you, you find ways around these things. And if, when crisis dictates and you're Roosevelt, you try to pack the Supreme Court, even if that's not consistent with the democratic values. So if, if something's bad enough, you, you can usually find a way around, around these issues. And Adam Smith's approach in that sense was uh, implicitly about enlightened self interest and that's what I'm talking about. Okay? There is a scope for everyone recognizing that it's in their interest to cooperate because they get something out of it. I agree. Alas, it happens all too infrequently, I think, so. Uh, yes, ma'am. That's a good question. I think the distinction that needs to be uh, made is between primary voting and, and general election voting. And, and the stuff that Professor Levinowski and I were talking about is primarily that uh, uh, economic voting is a referendum by and large on the incumbent's performance. Not so much do we want a, a left-wing president or a right-wing president, but do we want to keep the person in office who's there now, no matter what, what their party affiliation may, may be. And so. Uh, within, within a Republican primary, they're realizing we are all going to face a relatively common benefit from being able to run against Ob Obama. You know, there might be some differentiation around the edges. Did I run a corporation? Was I a governor? Um, was I a governor for uh, two years and then disappear? You know, these, sort, these sorts of things. So uh, there, there's probably going to be some differentiation, but within a primary electorate, you're, you're trying to win over people who are, by and large, all going to vote against uh, Barack Obama no matter which of the candidates emerges. And so you end up competing on these, I'll call valence issues, which are generally not particularly policy uh, related or, or only marginally uh, policy related. And you're just trying to generally say, look, I'm a person who's good for the Republicans. And I think that's why you see issues like HPV or Mormonism or um, you know, were, were Perry's energy investments in Texas a good idea or a bad idea being uh, the, the types of issues that come up but rather than am I going to be a good steward for the economy because in the end they're all going to say yep I'm going to be a good steward <laughs> for the economy uh, you know pick me and, and so it's really, it's really hard to make choices on that basis. Yes sir. It seems one of the few things that politicians can agree on now um, is attacking China for interfering with their currency and just as shown this weekend in the Senate or the presidential debates last night um, it seems like uh, they want to take action against China for so-called price war. What are your opinions on price war and should anything be done? So I think it's highly political. I think it's, uh, it's uh, when you have some problems, when the economy is not doing well, you blame some, someone, right? So in the 70s, you blame Japan. Now you blame China. And uh, uh, the currency is a factor that determines the trade surplus between US and China, but that's now the major factor. I think the major factor is that China just have a larger population and it's cheap. And it's cheap to do anything. It's cheap to produce those labor intensive products. And I think that's the major thing. Uh, China has been and always been a, a a, a, a issue in the in the debate in the campaigns uh, over the last 20 years because China is rising. So I think that's only a political uh, issue. It's a political consideration behind that argument. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think there's a difference between position taking and policy making. And I think this is just a sort of case of position taking that 
you know, yes, we should, you know, we can all agree that we should be tough on China, but I don't think anyone actually expects there to be, I, you know, there's a difference between passing a bill and making a law. So I think this is the case where people have a vote on something that they don't expect to have a lot of policy consequences. They just want to be able to write a press release about how they're being tough on China. Just to amend to that, though, I mean, recently Brazil has actually taken to the WTO, the World Trade Organization, a proposal that currency be formally considered as a trade issue and something that the WTO should have a position and sort of structure around. Um, I don't think that's ever going to happen, but, you know, it takes your point seriously, which is that, you know, Increasingly, in a globalized world, there's you know this this is this is a concern for a lot of different countries. Um, I think both professors are right that usually it's sort of ad hoc and 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 um, the issue emerges when people feel bad about themselves. But um, it would be interesting, I think, to see, and I think that probably we will see some attempts at least to make some kind of systematic um, you know, uh, governance structure around it. Yes, sir. By your definition, uh, recent. Uh, yeah, don't, don't call me on that. So what do you think the, let's assume the EU and the U.S. is needed to recapitalize their banks. And thus, then after that, let's reach the fall. Mm -hmm. Because they're going to default. Yeah. Whether it be this year or next year, they're going to default. Yeah. And it'll be enough to define the fall. You can define it to make it, quote, a soft default or a hard default, which is not and also, with all of those severity, their GDP doesn't grow. So it's not going to grow their way out of this. That's yeah. darn sure, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. I so, so what do you do? Why not let? Why not recapitalize the banks that are at risk? And let, let the country default. That's an interesting point, and there actually, you know, there's been a lot of talk about that, right? Like, well, Greece and France are on the hook for having lent out. Uh, sorry, Germany and France are on the hook for having lent out to Greece. So why give the money to the Greek government? Let's just give it to our own banks. I mean, of course, this raises all sorts of moral hazard problems, to the tune of, well, these banks were lending to Greece because they were getting, you know, premium interest rates um, for, and you know, which were supposed to take into account the risk of default. And now we're not. I mean, it's the same. Um, argument against bailouts you know, all over the place. Um, I mean, I think that what remains, though, is I mean, uh, what's going to what, what would then happen if we solve the liquidity crisis among the banks firsthand and just let the solvency stuff work itself out, right? Um, you know, particularly with the European structure of economies as it is, Greece isn't the only problem, right? So I mean, people say, well. Greece defaults, not a big deal on its face, you know, the average time of markets being shut out, or of government, of countries being shut out of capital markets after a default is actually like four or five years, they'd get over it. Um, but there still are raised then these political questions about what happens to the rest of Europe, you know, can they withstand just Greece leaving, you know, will Portugal leave? I'm sure you've heard all this before, but I don't think that there's an answer to it like this. Yes, sir. Yeah, great question. One, one clarification point that I should make is the economy is important because it moves voters around in a bandwidth of about 10 percentage points, which is to say it can make an election go from 55-45 one way to 55-45 the other. And so it's a very important phenomenon in terms of deciding elections. In terms of uh, the, the largest factor in how e each individual person votes is going to be their, their, their partisanship. And, and so it's not that uh, the economy is the, the number one factor in terms of, of, of changing each individual person's vote. It's just very important in terms of, in terms of who wins elections. So uh, that's sort of one clarifying point to make up front. But I, th but I think your, your question is a great one, which is um, do the proper incentives exist for politicians to create uh, a good policy or to, or to, to turn, your, turn your question around? Are there incentives for politicians to engage in certain behavior right leading up to an election that might be might be bad, and I think there's lots of research within political science that suggests that that's that's uh, just the case. And I think it's one of the reasons why you try to do things like have an independent central bank that isn't making decisions about monetary policy on the basis of, of an election, and why you probably don't want to have an elected uh, elected head of the of the Fed, even you know, no matter what what you hear in a, in a debate last night. And so 
Um, there are definitely interesting examples in institutional design, but um, I'm a, a former professor here, Neil Mahotra has research showing that uh, politicians, in fact, overinvest in cleaning up from disasters instead of preventing disasters in, in the meantime because of this. And so this is a, a, a consistent battle that you're, you're facing when, when dealing with the, dem the Democratic electorate is how do we do this? And, and we can do things like have independent bodies, but then we have other concerns that we're losing the democratic flavor of, of, of rule. And so uh, the balancing act between those two is a, is a, is a, is a tough thing and, and not, and not an easy, easy problem to solve. One last question. Yes. This week. Um, the whole team changed the course and there's still like a year left, but for each panelist and even the um, lovely moderator, who's going to be the public nominee? <laughs> An appropriate last question. Who's going to be the Republican nominee? Yeah, who's going to win it overall? Who's going to win it overall? Um, well, I'm almost always wrong, number one. <laughs> uh, but I would say that Romney will be the nominee and Obama will win. I'll answer your question with the computer since um, <laughs> why bother us answer? But there are actually gambling sites that, uh, as, an as a person trained in economics, uh, if we're connected to the net, which we might not be, um, can tell us who is going to is going to be uh, the, the nominee and who's going to win. So since I can't get the website to load, I'll just tell you what they say. Um, as of yesterday, Obama was given a 47 percent chance to win, which probably reflects about a even electorate because there's some probability that Obama won't run either due to um, death or or some other strange event happening that that could lead to that. So we'll, it's about roughly 50-50 election. Uh, the markets say Romney has about a 70 percent chance of winning the Republican nomination, that Perry and Kane have about a 10 percent chance, and that someone else has about a 10 percent chance uh, among the remaining, remaining candidates. And since I believe in markets being <laughs> relatively efficient, if not perfect, probably not perfectly efficient, that uh, I'll, I'll say that's the truth. Uh, I'll stick with Ed's answer. I'll say that I think Obama might win closely just because if there's one thing he's really good at, it's knowing how to run a campaign. <laughs> and if you've looked, they actually have a very sophisticated, the political machine behind them is very sophisticated. It, particularly if, if it's Romney, then I think Romney has the best, ch best chance of defeating him. I don't think any of the other candidates have the elite level endorsements necessary to really run a very effective campaign. And I think Democrats have actually probably taken a slight leap ahead of Republicans in terms of GOTV things. But that said, if Obama does win re-election, Absent something pretty dramatic happening, I would expect it to be by a very small margin. My head goes with Ed and Matt, but my heart kind of goes with um, Huntsman. I think that would be really fun, like sort of salaciously. Um, I'd enjoy watching that, but I don't think the world operates to further my enjoyment. So. I also support Huntsman because he can speak Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> and Captain Beefheart is like his favorite musician, which I think right, is yes. phenomenal. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Well, I want to thank my colleagues. This has been terrific. But I also want to thank you. Um, and most of all, Eileen Doherty Sill uh, and the folks from External Affairs at SAS for helping to put on this event. So thank you all. Since there, you just like